It's not something that happened overnight. It's been going on in the shadow of a world that we thought was a U.S.-Soviet Cold War rivalry, and it has accelerated in the last 25, 30 years since. All of the benefits of you know, human achievement are coming to ASEAN at this time that you young people you know, get to benefit from it. So you should be incredibly confident, proud, grateful, feel lucky, you know, explore. Welcome to the Leaders of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Ling Ling. The Leaders of Learning podcast show is a podcast show that explores learning in the 21st century, where I interview leaders, academics, experts, and entrepreneurs on professional and organizational development. Since the turn of the century, Asia is playing a bigger role in shaping the world economy, politics, and in global leadership. For example, there is an increase in inbound tourism into countries such as Japan, South Korea, and Thailand. The movement of the workforce across regions becomes more habituous, such as the Filipino nurses, Indian engineers, Nepali security guards, and many more. There's also an increase in technology and innovative startups with funds pouring in from Western nations. The Asian landscape is greatly diverse and complex. What makes Asia the place to be in the 21st century? How can an Asian citizen prepare themselves for their rise on the global stage? Joining us is Dr. Parag Khanna. He is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. He is the founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. He recently released a book called The Futurist Asian. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Ling Ling. Nice to speak with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. You have such a fantastic career doing international relations, foreign policy advising, and so on. How did you get into this realm? What motivated you to get into this field? Well, you know, I've gotten a bit reflective lately because it's been almost 30 years since the Berlin Wall fell. And uh, you're so young and sprightly, you probably don't remember that day, but uh, it was uh, November 1989. And uh, I was uh, in New York. I grew up partially in New York. And uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, my parents took me to Berlin and they said, you just got to see this in person. So seeing the end of the Cold War live in person was the most life-changing experience for me. And I was only 12 years old. So from that day forward, I basically knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, whether I'm advising companies or working in governments. Um, You know, to me, it's all the same. You know, it's the pursuit of kind of global knowledge and studying globalization. That's really interesting. I'm not that much younger than you, by the way. I do remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, although I was a little bit too young to understand what it means when people are dancing on a concrete wall and doing graffiti. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, see, now you just get to do that everywhere in the world because we, you know, we live in a free world. I know you've released a book recently called "The Future Is Asian." It's a thick book. I'm halfway through it. And I find it super interesting. Can you tell us what you mean by the future is Asian? Oh, absolutely. You know, and the book really is a corrective on the last 15 years of writing about Asia, where everything has been about China, 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 China. And, uh, you know, if this book had been written by someone else, it would have been called The Future is Chinese. But I called it The Future is Asian because Asia is much bigger than China. China is an important part of Asia, the most important country in Asia, the superpower of the world that comes from Asia. But it is not all of Asia. You know, Asia is 5 billion people and China is only 1.5 billion of those people. There are countries like India that now that will soon have a larger population than China does. India is growing faster as an economy than China is. India receives more foreign investment than China does and will continue to. And uh, ASEAN, the sub-region of 700 million people of Southeast Asia, has a larger economy than India and also receives more foreign investment than China. So Asia is very large and multipolar and diverse and distributed and, you know, really polycentric, you might say. 
So to reduce it all to China is a huge mistake. So I wanted to correct that. I think that's also the perception of the people in ASEAN as well, because I'm a citizen of ASEAN. I live in Singapore, although my family is based in Malaysia. And when we talk about the economy, usually China comes up as well. So the perception is China is like the future, no? Well, again, China is a big part of the future. It's already a big part of the present, quite frankly. You know, it's basically the largest economy in the world. And it is, again, a geopolitical power. But the problem is when we reduce the future to one country, it kind of makes no sense. You know, when I keep bombarding you with facts, you know, about how, wait, there are other countries that are bigger than China and fasting, growing faster than China. And we live in a world of nuclear deterrence, you know, where China can't really conquer anyone, uh, even if it tried. You know, we live in a very different world. So my goal is not just to explore Asia and the role of China and other countries within Asia, but it's a global picture of how not just China, but all Asians, collectively, the diasporas, the business people, the students are really reshaping the world. And that also is a much bigger story than China. And, and the biggest story of all is the fact that we live in a, again, a multipolar world. America is not disappearing. Europe is not disappearing. You know, Africa and Latin America are rising. So we have to appreciate that, you know, no matter what happens with China, we live in, for the first time in history, in a world where power is so distributed across the world amongst many great civilizations and countries. And no matter what China wants or doesn't want, the world is going to be this rich and diversified landscape of powers and civilizations. And I think it's great that China is rising and that China is a huge part of that story. But China will not rule the world, basically. Uh, No one will. America won't. Europe won't. No one will. And that's the moment, the period of history that we're in And that's the most fundamental fact of the world today. Right. Do you see that it's a good thing that we have multi superpowers in the world instead of like the past century? A lot of it is Europe focused in the 20th century is America focused. But now it's like you say, multi power focused. Right. Do you see that as a good thing in the world? Absolutely. You know, I mean, look, I think that we should celebrate culture, societies that have long been suppressed and neglected and colonized standing up for themselves and finding their place in the world voluntarily. You know, this is the first time in centuries that Africa or South Asian countries are able to say, we voluntarily make these trade agreements. You know, we want your investment. You know, we, we are, they are literally deciding for themselves what's best for them. And it's been a long time and they're seizing that moment. You can feel the pride, you know, everywhere from India to Kenya uh, about this. And you can actually hear their diplomat. They get told by Western diplomats, beware, China is trapping you in debt, you know, and stuff like that. They say, thank you very much. We know what's going on. We can make our own decisions. You know, you didn't help us much either. You know, so I think we're having for the first time a truly, you know, level playing field of a conversation about the world rather than one one that's dominated by Washington's view or London's view. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful Where do you see ASEAN or Southeast Asia in all of this? I see it having a very important place. Look, if you treat ASEAN as a regional economic system, as we should, it's already the third or fourth, it's a fourth largest economic area in the world behind the European Union, the United States and China. So ASEAN is a very big deal and India close behind in fifth place. So again, three out of the five major economic zones in the world are in Asia and ASEAN is an extremely important part of that. What we've been seeing for the last, you know, 10 years is that supply chains are shifting out of China towards ASEAN. You know, we're seeing regional integration, the mobility of people, the fluidity of investment in supply chains, and and the the rights of students and journalists and companies and business travelers to move seamlessly around the region. All of that is happening. And that's a really, really positive story that uh, ASEAN represents. Like me, I'm a citizen of ASEAN, right? With the rise of all these economic and regional sectors, what does it mean to me? What can I do that I couldn't have done 10 years ago? Right. I mean, I think a lot of things are different now. You know, back then you couldn't just hop on any one of these low cost airline carriers and shuttle around the region for so cheap. You don't need visas. You don't need any special residency requirement. Uh, Any university you study at, your degree is going to be recognized. You don't have to redo any professional certifications like you know, dentistry or something like that. You know, driver's licenses, you name it. So, so many things are truly seamless now. So, I mean, you know, I'm so glad that you use this phrase, you know, I'm a citizen of ASEAN, because, of course, that's not something anyone would have even said 10 years ago. 
you would just say, I'm Malaysian, I'm from Laos, I'm from Cambodia. But to say that you have a certain pride in ASEAN is a very positive thing. And, and uh, I wrote an article a couple of years ago called Time for an ASEAN Dream. And of course, everyone talks about the American dream, the China dream, the Indian dream. So why isn't there an ASEAN dream, you know, uh, this sort of unity and diversity? So to me, the way you're talking, you really embody this uh, ASEAN dream. Well, I say that I am an ASEAN citizen is because of the kind of career that I've embarked on. I was previously a learning and development manager, and I had the opportunity to provide training in almost all the ASEAN countries. I'm Malaysian born, but now I'm residing in Singapore, and I have friends in all over the ASEAN nation. So I do feel like all the ASEAN nations are somewhat a bit of like my home. And not only that, I do see among my peers whenever they get a day off or whenever you know they are able to take leave the trips are usually around asean or their work now even their companies now their clients their peers are all over asean so i think we're beginning to see that with the rise of asia well you know asians do travel more in asia than outside of asia you know and i think that's very important to remember so asians have a lot to learn and discover about each other. So one of the things I point out in the book is that it's been 500 years since the last era of the Silk Roads. So the last time that Asians really had rich and regular interactions with each other's societies literally was like 500 years ago. So therefore, of course, no one alive today can remember what that time was. So Asians are rediscovering Asia. And and again, you're an example of that. And I call it the Erasmus effect. So in Europe, when the European, when, you know, again, going back to the Berlin Wall falling and the end of the Cold War, and you, know, you started to have more and more social integration across the European Union, and they created this exchange program called Erasmus. And um, 20 years later, you now have this, this study that has showed that there's what they call Erasmus babies. There's a whole generation of kids, more than a million kids wow. in Europe have two parents have parents from two different European countries because their parents met while doing study abroad through the Erasmus program. Wow. So I think, you know, and one of the things I've written about is how we've got these ASEAN babies, Mm -hmm. you know, you've got a (laughs) Malaysian and a, you know, a Malaysian and a Burmese parent or a Vietnamese and a Thai parent or something like that. And that's happening as well. And, you know, again, you can only measure these things at a kind of generational timescale but I'm seeing the early indications of it already. And again, it's very, very promising. I mentioned really briefly that in previous centuries, the focus was on Europe and America. Is there anything that made the focus to shift towards Asia? What is it about Asian nations that became the center of attention in this century as compared to previous centuries? It's a great question. Um, you know, it's sort of a historical one, but a geopolitical one. I mean, you know, to be honest, the story really begins with the rise of Japan in the post-war decades. And Japan was the first Asian power after the end of World War II to really rise up economically and prove Asia's technological and economic potential. And that inspired the tiger economies, right? Southeast Asia, uh, South, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And then you had the rise of China. And now you have the rise of South and Southeast Asia. So, you know, Pakistan through India, through, the, through, through Indonesia and the Philippines. So we've now, we're now into the fourth wave of Asian growth since the end of World War II. And these waves have reinforced each other very positively. You know, Japan inspired the tigers. And Japan and the tigers were the largest investors in China. China would not be what it is today if it weren't for the fact that Japan and South Korea and Taiwan were already rich, right, and proved to be a role model with billions of dollars to invest in China. And now what's happening is that Japan and South Korea and China are the leading investors in Pakistan and India and Indonesia and Thailand and the Philippines, right? So Asians are reinforcing each other's growth stories. When you ask what has happened, it's not something that happened overnight. It's been going on in the shadow of a world that we thought was a U.S.-Soviet Cold War rivalry, and it has accelerated in the last 25, 30 years since. How come? How come it has accelerated in the last few decades? Well, because Asians have a lot of complementarities with each other, and those complementarities were almost frozen during the Cold War period. You know, countries were divided into two different camps. There was still a lot of poverty. You know, there was a lot of insecurity. 
And a lot of that mistrust and suspicion started to be overcome with the end of the, at the end of the Cold War. And again, there's that history. Asians have thousands of years of history of the Silk Roads. It's just that they weren't able to exploit it for a few hundred years. But somehow that instinct is there. Chinese know how to trade with Japanese, with Koreans, and they all know how to trade with the people of Southeast Asia, um, you know, the, the kingdoms, uh, what used to be the, the, the medieval kingdoms of, uh, of Indonesia know how to trade with the Indians and the Indians know how to trade with the Arabs and so forth. And all of that, you've got 2,000 years of history of that. So the fact that it's coming back to life shouldn't really surprise anyone. You know, and yet the reason you asked the question and the reason I wrote this book is, again, no one alive today was alive 500 years ago. So we simply could not, have, you know, we've simply forgotten collectively that we've already been here. We've been here before in this world of Asianization, as I call it, you know. Of the, and so, you know, in the beginning of the chapter two of the book, I give a 2,000 years of Asian history condensed into like 30 pages. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of like, uh, you know, everything you ever wanted to know about the kind of previous eras of Asian interactions with each other. And it's incredible how much, uh, you know, spread of technology and, and, and commerce and religion and ideas there were during these pre-technological periods. It's really, really magical almost to, to go back and see that. And of course, now to appreciate how we're recovering it. It takes a lot of time, money and effort to put the show together. As an independent podcaster, I'm ever so grateful to partners who are willing to support the show and keep it running. Let's take a break and hear from our partners. When was the last time you took a moment to reflect on your career goals? Don't you wish to take control of your future? Well, it's time you made that shift from being an individual contributor to a forward-looking leader. Go beyond domain knowledge and functional expertise to claim your leadership position. Explore the 18 months part-time executive MBA at SP Jane School of Global Management, one of Asia's top-ranked business schools. The SP Jane Executive MBA is designed to nurture leadership and business skills of busy working professionals like you. Its part-time and flexible structure allows learning without interrupting your career to help you graduate with a globally recognized Australian degree. Want to know more about the program? Why don't you join us for an exclusive open house for a chance to meet current students, alumni, and faculty? Faculty. Discover how the SP Jane EMBA can help you. To know more and register, call plus six five nine zero six six zero zero seven four or visit www.spjane.sg. That is www.spjain.sg. Let's get back to the show. So the way you describe ASEAN, it's more of like a collective of nations of different cultures of different languages, but yet learn how to navigate with each other for mutual economic benefit. So when one country is rich, they know how to invest in another. Another country is rich, they know how to invest in another. And they engage in this activity of spreading wealth among their neighbors and so on. Can I describe Asia that way? Absolutely. I mean, you actually you summed it up perfectly. You know, that, that is exactly what is, ha what is happening. You know, they know where the opportunities are to leverage low cost labor, very large market. Some countries are really good with industry, others are rich in natural resources, others are agricultural centers, and so forth. And again, these complementarities, Singapore has lots of money, but very little land. Other countries have lots of land and very little money. You know, and economics in a nutshell is right, the optimization or the, uh, of land, labor, and capital. Right. And, uh, you know, ASEAN or Asia in general has these tremendous complementarities. So we spoke mostly about the economic perspective of it, but each of countries within Asia itself, they have their political challenges. So the political challenges of Indonesia is very different from Thailand, from Myanmar, from India, from China. Do you see these as the common barriers among Asian nations to, you know, prevent them from becoming great in the century or what do you see might be the common barriers for Asian nations? Well, the truth is that differences in political systems and culture are not a barrier. You know, to me, one of the great unanswered questions is how it is that Asians manage to trade 
trillions of dollars with each other, even though they don't speak each other's languages, right? I mean, it's unbelievable how versatile actually you have to be to be a pan-Asian business person, you know, uh, and, and moving around, given how uh, mutually unintelligible our cultures actually are. You know, Indians and Chinese know absolutely nothing about each other, but they trade almost $100 billion a year, right? Um, so it really is something. And again, it's one of these great unanswered questions of how the Silk Roads have functioned for centuries, despite there not being a common language. You know, the last Silk Road era that really thrived, I mean, the main uh, languages were Persian, right? That's how long ago we're talking, right? That would not be the main language of the Silk Road today. It would be English or Chinese or whatever. So political, the fact that we have differences, in some countries are democracies and others are not democracies, and some countries are Muslim and others are Christian and others are Buddhist. None of that has inhibited this collective Asian rise and, and exploitation of complementarity. None of it. It's really, really remarkable. Wow. Did you see anything that hinders the rise of Asian nations, if not their own political situation or cultural differences? Well, again, you know, again, the mistakes they make internally, right? I mean, you know, you, if you have corruption scandals and slow growth and poor investment and not following through on trade and investment agreements and this kind of thing. Well, obviously that's, you could call those own goals. You know, Malaysia has had its fair share of own goals. Thailand has too, you know, Vietnam as well, but still we're moving along, you know, Indonesia, of course, also still the region is moving along and, and absorbing some of its own mistakes and continuing to churn forward. On the whole, I see a lot of pragmatism right now. You know, I mean, obviously there could be war, right? I mean, you know, if there's a war in the South China Sea, that's obviously not that good for business, right? So, you know, I don't discount these downside scenarios. It's just that you have to take them one by one and ask very specifically what the impact of those things will be, right? You know, we have 30 years right now in Asia of not having had a major war, even though most of the world expected there to be a war over Taiwan or whatever the case may be. So I actually think that there is a decent amount of diplomatic maturity in the region. What do you foresee will happen in Asia in the next maybe 20, 30 years? Well, it's a big, big question. I mean, you know, first of all, we're because we're only a couple of decades in to this entire era of the new Silk Roads, right? I expect it to continue, first of all. You know, I mean, there, there is, remember that 5 billion people almost 2 billion of whom are still relatively poor or very poor, have yet to be fully integrated in this Asian story. Lots of complementarity is still untapped. You know, lots of markets where you still don't have full mobile penetration or high rates of e-commerce and mobile banking. Lots of complementarities demographically. You know, right now in the next 30 years, to, to be very specific, look at how some countries are aging so rapidly, like China and South Korea and Japan, Meanwhile, you've got super young populations in India and Southeast Asia. So we're starting to see a lot more flows of people, younger people moving to the older societies that really need the labor force. And so a lot more demographic interpenetration in Asia in the next couple, coming decades as well. But there's also, you know, let's not forget huge environmental challenges, right? So in the next couple of decades, the impact of climate change on food production or floods or rising sea levels, coastal cities is going to be a very big and very negative story that has to be managed, obviously, with a lot of foresight and investment and kind of pragmatism and cooperation. There's pros and there's good, there's, there's positives and negatives to the next couple of decades. I know the World Economic Forum, they came up with, you know, 10 important skills for the future of jobs. And some of it includes things like complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity. What should I focus on so that I won't be left behind with the rise of Asia? It's very interesting about the WEF study and others that are looking at the most important skills of the future, because I think it's important to point out that whereas we have tended to think that you need certain skills in Western advanced industrial services driven economies and a different set of skills in you know lower productivity, uh, lower standard Asian economies, in fact, what we're seeing for young people is that it's become a global services economy and it's similar skills that people need. Like you need to, you should learn how to code whether you're a kid in Vietnam or a kid in San Francisco, right? That's actually really interesting. So thinking about, uh, you know, obviously managing people, you know, so people management is another one of the skills they identify. 
So I do think that whether you are a young person growing up in ASEAN or, or in the West, you know, you should kind of follow those prescriptions to some degree. And this obviously means that there is a tension, right, between do I go wide or do I do go deep? You know, do I study liberal arts or do I study math and science? And the kind of middle ground is don't just think of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, but add in the letter A. In the middle, you get STEAM, right? And don't forget the arts. And, you know, I do think that holistic view is important. You know, I think about my own career and, and studying political science and international relations, but now I've steeped myself a lot in economics and technology And it's really helped me to create a more kind of holistic picture of the world and keep up with the latest uh, trends. What this research tells us today may tell us something different tomorrow. And yet we should be prepared for whatever it's going to tell us tomorrow about the day after tomorrow, because we're still going to be alive. Just following on that, what you've said about being holistic in terms of, you know, upgrading ourselves and our, our skills with the rise of Asia, I don't want to be left behind. I want to be a part of it. And as an Asian citizen, what do you think I should do to prepare myself and be part of that? I think, you know, you're actually a very good example of how to prepare for a kind of pan-Asian world, because actually, you know, you need to understand all of that, that the diversity of the ASEAN region. We have very, very different degrees of economic development in the region, different rates of technology impact, and e-commerce, and social media. So to travel around the region and get to know the different markets and societies across Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and so forth is a really, really important skill set. And there's going to be a need for a lot of people to actually you know, work in that pan-Asian, pan-ASEAN way in the, uh, in the years ahead. So, so you know, knowing, knowing technology, um, you know, being multidisciplinary, but also traveling around this region will be great preparation. Excellent. A lot of my listeners on the podcast show, they come from ASEAN nations. So the biggest download or listenership is from Vietnam, followed by Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Do you have any parting words or advice for them when it comes to the future of uh, Asia? I'm, I'm delighted to hear that's your audience, because to me, the most enriching thing in the last five, six years of my life since moving to Singapore has been traveling around ASEAN and coming to appreciate the unbelievable dynamism and energy. I have to emphasize, you know, this is literally the period of history where the stars are aligning for ASEAN. You know, it's a very, very special moment. And, you know, it's not an accident. You know, every region of the world, think about Europe in the 19th century and America in the 20th century, you know, th this is literally foreordained. It is cosmic, you know, that, that you get to live at this time when all the stars are aligning economically and demographically. It's a young region, a fast growing region, the borders are coming down, the technology is coming in. All of the benefits of, you know, human achievement <laughs> are coming to ASEAN at this time that you young people you know, get to benefit from it. So you should be incredibly confident, proud, grateful, feel lucky, you know, explore. Because, you know, again, as I've, I've said kind of relentlessly in this book, it's sort of like the world of the past was that you look to Europe and you look to America as kind of your role model and guide. And that's all changing now. You know, we are doing the innovation here. You know, we are the test bed of innovation and the, the drivers of innovation. So I think it's a, it's just an amazing time to be a citizen of ASEAN like you. Thank you so much for your time, Parag, for being on my show. If anyone wants to reach out to you, how can they do so? Oh, uh, you can check out my website, uh, paragkana.com, Facebook and LinkedIn as well. And drop me a line in any way you like. Thank you again, Parag. My pleasure. Great talking to you. That was Dr. Parag Kana who is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. In our next episode, we will speak to Rochelle Clark, a global strategist and founder of Succession Strength, to talk about succession planning in the workplace and in family businesses. Highlights from this episode and contact details of our guest is available on our new website at www.leadersoflearning.asia that is www.leadersoflearning.asia If you enjoy listening to this podcast, take a moment to rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, CastBox, or wherever you download your podcast. 
If you believe this podcast show will help a friend, a colleague, or a family member, please share this episode with them via social media or your podcast app. I'm your host, Ling Ling. Thank you for listening to the Leaders of Learning podcast.